Hello and welcome to this London Climate Action Week event on climate change and sovereign risk. I am Uli Vods, I'm the director of the SOAR Centre for Sustainable Finance and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event. Um, the game plan is as follows. Together with John Byrne from the Bank Institute, I will present the new report on climate change and sovereign risk. Uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion with some excellent uh, panelists, which I will introduce later on. Um, and uh, we will also uh, welcome your comments and questions. Uh, so please uh, participate actively so that we can bring you in. So let me uh, first uh, start with a report. This is joint work by the SOA Center for Sustainable Finance, the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo, WWF in Singapore, and 427 in Berkeley, California. And the research was um, sponsored by the Inspire Network, which has been set up to support research that feeds into the work of the NGFs which is the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system. So this work is meant to uh, help central banks and supervisors and everyone working in this space uh, to uh, address this very critical issue. So the report is, is very comprehensive. So it's around 160 pages and, and will only give you a glimpse of, of, of some of the key messages now. Um, I will first talk a bit about the transmission channels of risks. Then John will present on the empirical work that we've done on the link between climate vulnerability and the cost of sovereign capital. And then I will present you the main policy recommendations uh, and that will then uh, lead over to discussion uh, with us. So let me talk, uh, first uh, say a bit about the transmission channels of risks. Here you have a, a chart from the report which shows seven different channels through which the physical and the transition impacts of climate change can have an impact on macro financial risk and ultimately sovereign risk. And I won't have time now to, to go uh, through each of them in detail, but just let me highlight a few points uh, on each of them. So first of all, the first channel is depletion of natural capital and natural services. And basically all economic activities in one way or another are dependent on natural capital, be it fresh water or um, um, other natural services. So um, we know that climate change is uh, contributing to further depletion of natural capital uh, and undermining natural services. And uh, this can have quite significant impacts uh, for economies at large, um, kind of uh, the impact, uh, for example, of, of erosion of natural capital on sectors such as agriculture is very obvious, but uh, there are many others who can be, uh, that can be affected. Um, the second risk channel is also very straightforward, the fiscal impacts of climate related disasters. Uh, so we've seen um, uh, a lot of examples where climate disasters um, uh, basically wiped out entire um, economies, regions, and um, uh, uh, these amounted often to a very large share of GDP. Uh, uh, um, uh, in, in some cases up 206% of GDP uh, were destroyed through one single disaster and you, you can imagine what this means for uh, public finances. Uh, and of course, even if uh, public assets are not directly uh, hit as badly, uh, there are contingent liabilities by uh, the government. Uh, the government will have to support reconstruction, will have to support households and businesses uh, to weather disasters. Uh, so this can be very, very costly and uh, there is a rich evidence on that. 
The third channel is about the fiscal consequences of adaptation and mitigation policies. We do need large scale investment in both adaptation and mitigation. And even though we know that both adaptation and mitigation investments are actually uh, very good because they help to bring Gone, uh, gone down dramatically, but still our energy systems uh, to renewables will uh, um, uh, uh, require large resources. And importantly, especially for climate vulnerable countries, there is a very large need of investing in adaptation to boost resilience. Uh, so that can also uh, strain public finances. The fourth channel is about macroeconomic impacts of climate change. And um, there are many ways how the macroeconomy can be affected. Uh, climate change can cause supply shocks, demand shocks. These can be temporary, but they can also be permanent. Uh, very structural impact on many of our economies. And public expenses. Then the fifth channel is about uh, climate-related risks and financial sector stability. It is now widely recognized that climate change can have material impact on financial stability, both at the level of individual financial institutions, but also uh, of financial systems at large. And there are uh, indeed risks that climate change can threaten financial stability and that this can translate we have seen for example during the euro crisis how um lead to so-called doom loops, uh, so where financial instability can lead to instability uh, of public finances, uh, and this in turn uh, can have negative feedback on the financial sector. Um, and for example, we uh, look at uh, the Southeast Asian region, and we have a special chapter in our report on uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, we can see that there are a lot of linkages between the financial sector and public finances, uh, partly through publicly owned banks, uh, pension funds, and so on, and exposure example of uh, the financial system of many related assets, for example, coal. So there is a high stranded asset risk, high transition risk in the financial system of, of Asian countries, but many other countries, and uh, if not addressed properly, mitigated properly, uh, this can, can uh, be very problematic. The sixth channel is about the impact of climate change on international trade and capital flows, which again is a very important channel and often overlooked. Um, and uh, I think uh, we, we can, or we illustrate nicely in our report with the Southeast Asian countries, um, how uh, trade can be affected by climate change and that this can have very significant effects. So for example, um, around 70% of the region's many disrupted by and um, indeed, there is a high risk that with increasing incidence of these disasters, the current value chain production chains won't be able to run uh, as they did. So that could have a big impact. Uh, or if you look at the impact of climate change on agricultural output, which oh, uh, can be severe, 
um, around 24% of Indonesia's exports are in agriculture, um, or uh, around 10% in Thailand and Vietnam. Uh, if, if this is impacted, uh, this can severely worsen the balance of payment. Or if you take tourism, more than 20% of Thailand's exports are in tourism. If Uh, tourist areas. Uh, this can really have detrimental effects on employment output and also public finances. Um, the last channel I want to highlight, or maybe just one more thing on trade, um, there are some countries which are of course very heavily dependent on fossil fuel exports. In Southeast Asia, Brunei, which has around 85% of its exports in fossil, um, and if we have China, Japan, um, and others moving away from coal, or also, uh, then you know external balance will look dramatically different, and they can have severe uh, consequences. And last but not least, um, climate change can also have uh, which we know that. So, um, sorry, I'm just running through that very quickly, but, but uh, you can get a taste of, of what we're looking at in the report. Um, and um, uh, so for each country, it's important to have a careful analysis, what the specific risk factors are and how they may play out and how they can be addressed. Um, as I said, we do have a very comprehensive chapter on Southeast Asia. Um, uh, of course, I'm not, not going to present now. But uh, I'll hand it now to John, who presents uh, some of the stuff we've done on nexus between climate vulnerability and cost of sovereign borrowing. John, over to you. Thank you, Uli. So yes, we also carry out an empirical analysis um, to look at the impact of climate risk vulnerability and climate risk resilience on the cost of sovereign borrowing. Um, to do that, we employ two different approaches. The first one is a panel regression across 40 advanced and emerging markets um, over the period 2002 to 2018 using quarterly data. Um, the second approach that we use is a structural panel VAR, and we use this approach to examine how sovereign bond yields react to shocks imposed on the climate risk variables. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so prior to um, jumping into the results, it's important, first of all, to look, have a look at the raw data and what that tells us. So plotted here on the left-hand side is the sovereign bond yield relative to a measure of climate risk vulnerability taken from ND gain. It's actually a refined measure of ND gain. Um, this can be thought of as a, a broad measure of um, both physical and transition climate-related risks. And what we can see there from our sample of 40 economies is that we have a positive relationship between sovereign bond yields and climate risk vulnerability. So in other words, as vulnerability um, to climate risk increases, there's some positive premium on the sovereign bond yield, so positive um, relationship there from the raw data. On the right-hand chart, we can see uh, the plots for the same group of countries of sovereign bond yields relative to resilience. So this is resilience to climate risk, which um, we take from a database by FTSE Russell. And what we can see here is that we have a negative relationship um, between sovereign bond yields. Sorry, can you go back? A negative relationship between sovereign bond yields and climate risk resilience. Um, so in other words, as uh, resilience goes up, so this is what we want to see, of course, increased resilience to climate risk, the sovereign bond yield declines. So um, positive, sorry, positive effects on the sovereign bond yield in terms of reducing the cost of sovereign borrowing. Um, so can you go to the next slide, please? Next slide, please. 
So the empirical findings from our first empirical approach are given in this slide. Plotted are the coefficients for the climate risk um, variables. So the shaded, sorry, the blue um, color refers to the climate risk vulnerability coefficient, and the orange refers to the climate risk resilience. These are the results from a regression of sovereign bond yields across different country groupings um, on our climate risk variables, which also control for a range of domestic and global factors. Um, for simplicity, we plot here just the climate risk variables of interest. And what we can see here clearly is that as one moves from um, EMEs to ASEAN to a high risk group, that we have um, a higher um, premium on sovereign bond yields um, due to climate risk vulnerability. So, for example, if we focus on the, the last column, this is the high risk group. These are countries that are deemed to be in the high risk category for climate risk exposure. So they're in the top quartile um, relative to our uh, group of economies in our sample. And what we can see here is that for these economies, there's a premium attached to sovereign bond yields of around 270 basis points due to climate risk vulnerability. Um, compared to around half of that for the EME group overall at 110 basis points. The ASEAN group lies somewhere in the middle, whereby the premium on sovereign bond yields amounts to just over 150 basis points as a result of increased exposure to climate risk vulnerability. So that's the blue bar. Um, for the orange bar, this is our coefficient for climate risk resilience. And what we can see here is that across all of the different economy groupings, whether it be advanced, emerging, ASEAN, or high risk, we have a very similar um, magnitude of effect of less than 10 basis points across each of these uh, different economy groupings. Um, yeah, so I think what's important to note is that although the magnitude is small, um, it's still statistically significant for resilience. Um, for vulnerability, we don't find any significance for the advanced economy group. So the main message from, from this um, part of the analysis is that for higher risk economies, there's a much greater magnitude of an effect on sovereign bond yields as a result of climate risk resilience, sorry, climate risk vulnerability. For resilience, although the magnitude is small, it's statistically significant for all economy groups. And therefore, you know, it's important that economies continue to um, ramp up their efforts towards um, improving resilience in order to get these um, um, negative um, imp impacts on their sovereign bond yields. So next slide, please. Yeah, so the second approach that we look at is um, impulse response analysis from a, a structural panel bar. Um, so what we do here is that we, we impose positive shocks on climate risk vulnerability and climate risk resilience, and we assess how sovereign bond yields respond to these shocks. Um, for simplicity, I'll focus on the high risk economies. So that's the bottom two charts on the on the right hand side there and what we can see is that if we look at so the bottom left chart impulse response to vulnerability shock what we can see is that we have a positive response in bond yields as a result of a positive shock um, to climate risk vulnerability um, and if the the magnitude of this effect is much greater than that of advanced economies so the higher risk economies are particularly exposed to shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability. And as well as that, um, these effects do not um, subside over time. So we see permanent effects on bond yields um, deriving from shocks imposed on climate risk vulnerability. And this is a, this is a positive effect on, on sovereign bond yields. Um, if we look at the chart on the right hand side, so the very last chart, we, we, we see a negative effect. So in other words, 
um, a positive shock to resilience. So improved resilience has a dampening effect on yields, which is also in line with what we found in the previous analysis. And importantly, this effect also does not subside over time. So in order to reap um, permanent effects on bond yields, it's important um, that economies continue to improve their efforts towards um, increasing their resilience to climate risk exposure. And that would be the main summary of the empirical analysis. So I'll turn it back to Uli now. Thank you. So I'll quickly run through the policy recommendations of the report. And we highlight five areas uh, in which climate-related financial uh, 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 risks should be addressed in a coordinated manner. And um, so let me go through each of them in turn. So the first uh, is really to conduct a comprehensive assessment of vulnerability of individual countries and based on that develop a national adaptation plan. It's important that this is really a comprehensive um, analysis uh, differences to really identify and how to develop a national adaptation plan. A given climate change um, uh, involves forward have a systematic of the different potential solidity for the macroeconomy financial system for public finances uh, include both physical and transition risks. And we are suggesting that such an assessment should be conducted by a dedicated national climate risk board that importantly should also include central banks and supervisors, as well as key government departments, especially finance, economics, planning, um, so we have uh, where they exist involving uh, to work to risk and, and they need to be brought on board. They need to, to, to really assessment uh, that will then flow into uh, hands. The second, to mainstream climate risk in public. Hello, I hope you hear me. I was cited. Um, uh, John, can, can you hear me? You, I mean, the sound is intermittent, I would say. It's not okay, the best. Well, I, would, so I would suggest to go swiftly through it and get to the discussion. Yeah, I'll try to do that. So, um, so the second recommendation was to mainstream climate risk analysis in public financial management. Um, so this needs to include appropriate disclosure analysis uh, of risk. It needs to um, uh, include um, mainstreaming climate in budgetary processes. Um, finance ministries need to importantly enhance public sector funding and debt management strategy to look at debt instruments which uh, we have uh, risk share issues and also importantly look at a diversification of government revenue streams away from high risk sectors thirdly uh, and that is particularly now a point for central banks and supervisors uh, they need to address climate related risks in their monetary and prudential frameworks and operations 
and they need to make sure that the financial sector does uh, take account of these risks and, and uh, uh, mitigate these risks. So we need a mainstreaming of climate fi uh, related financial risks into macro and micro prudential supervision um, and uh, the policies of central banks and supervisors need to be aligned with climate and sustainability goals. And also importantly, um, to include um, uh, uh, address treatment of sovereign exposures in financial regulation. For the time being, sovereign debt is typically treated as zero risk, which is obviously not the case. Fourth, we argue that governments and financial authorities should implement financial sector policies that help to scale up investment in adaptation and also help to develop insurance solutions. And uh, monetary and financial authorities really have a lot of leverage and, and can help support develop financial market solutions, including local currency bond markets. They can help to develop fintech solutions to mobilize domestic savings for uh, financing climate resilient sustainable infrastructure. And they also can play a key role in developing insurance. Broadening insurance is really important because that also not only to resilience of households and businesses, but ultimately also takes the burden off from finances. And then finally, um, we argue that international support is needed uh, to mitigate and manage climate-related sovereign risks, especially in poorer countries. Um, the cruel irony is that uh, uh, climate change is hitting uh, those the most that have contributed the least to climate change. And uh, international financial institutions have an important role in supporting these countries to better address climate-related sovereign risks and strengthen the adaptive capacity and macro financial resilience. And they can do that in multiple ways. They can adaptation and solutions and these also provide emergency financing in case of crisis. So this brings me to an end of the presentation of this report. Um, the report is available. We'll share the link with you uh, in the chat. Uh, there's also a technical background paper on the econometric analysis uh, for those who, who want to uh, know a bit more. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to uh, move to the next part of this session, uh, which really is the core, and we have a fantastic lineup. Um, we have um, uh, five uh, panelists, and uh, I uh, call on them. So each will make a brief. panelists and, and uh, of course is invited to call. Let me first call Nisha uh, Krishnan, who is Senior Finance Action Track Associate at the Global Commission on Adaptation, uh, which has been playing a very important role in highlighting the importance of adaptation. And she's been working uh, on developing national climate finance, uh, budget tracking methodologies, helping uh, governments and also civil societies um, in uh, uh, scaling up adaptation finance. Is areas uh, that, that we've touched on in, in our foundations and I'm with uh, Nisha, the four years. Thanks very much, Ulrich and um, Dan and um, John for that presentation. I mean, I just wanted to say that this is a really rich 145 pages. So kudos to you and the other partners who've put this together. 
Um, I just wanted to say that this is a topic that's very near and dear to the Global Commission on Adaptation's heart. Uh, about a year ago, we released our Adapt Now report that really underlines um, and makes the sort of economic, moral, and environmental cases for investing in adaptation and resilience. Um, and we call for three revolutions, right? In understanding, uh, in understanding how we actually face, the, what risks we face, what are the vulnerabilities we have. Second, in planning. So how do we actually integrate all of the information uh, on risk and uh, exposure into our different processes, including in the ministries of finance, central banks, in agriculture ministries, in sector ministries. And the third piece is financing, right? So how does this all translate to actual changes in the financial system and what we prize and, um, uh, and value as, um, as things that we wanna see in our society? So I think that this report really hits the nail on the head in terms of making that further making that economic case for investing in adaptation and resilience, that it isn't just about um, investing in our infrastructure or growth, but that we need to do that in both low carbon as well as resilient ways. Um, and I think that there are this, what this also underlines, I believe, is that there are real financial consequences to countries around the world for us to not proactively address um, impacts that are potentially in our immediate horizon, but also in our long-term horizon. I think um, this message is even more important given that the current health crisis that we're dealing with uh, showcases the pressures that we're going to see on public purses. And that even now that the, the fiscal space and the limitations on fiscal space uh, means that we, whatever we're investing in currently should also look at climate risks and um, invest in that future now. Um, I think one of the things that really struck me was the permanence of this effect. Um, and it only underscores further that earlier investments in adaptation and resilience would actually bring greater benefits to us than later investments, right? Because the the sunk costs of, of not investing and the pathways that we then become, uh, that we are then on um, become unsustainable in the future. And so one of the questions that I have for maybe us to discuss and also for the audience to hopefully come in on is how do we communicate that message much more clearly that it is uh, smarter to invest now rather than uh, invest later. Um, and the other piece that I wanted to point out is that the commission is currently doing some analysis of stimulus responses so far over the last uh, eight or so months. And while a lot of that is focused on emergency response and social safety nets and such, but um, there are also a lot more longer term investments that are being made. But out of the 50 countries or so that we've looked at, um, and this is a range of developing and developed countries, both of these developed countries, small island states and emerging economies, only nine out of those 50 so far have looked at any semblance of adaptation and resilience within their plans. Um, and considering that there are possibly waves of response, this is probably something that we need to be um, sort of uh, making the message much clearer, I think, to countries as well as supporters, right, the international financial institutions, that this is something that we need to take up much more seriously. Um, maybe just a couple of, uh, one last comment. I know that I may be running against the five minute mark is that I am really excited that you brought up the national adaptation planning process. Uh, coming from a vulnerability and adaptation background, this is probably the first time that I've heard this explicitly stated in a sort of finance related conversation. Um, and I also really appreciate the fact that this really does need to be somewhat of a whole of economy and government approach to, to looking at NAPs, um, which generally have been much more in um, sort of budgeting process in ministries of finance and, and obviously the Ministry of Environment. But the fact that we need to expand this to a macroeconomic and fiscal approach is absolutely right. Uh, but I also want to make the point that we need to look at climate and integrating that into other economic development plans. And so this is a two way road and the extent to which um, international financial institutions like the IMF and others step up to do this, I think the better it is for us in the longer run. And with that, uh, I'm going to hand it back to you, Ali. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think you pointing out the understanding and financing dimensions is, is really important. And let me hand over to Marie. 
Um, so Marie is heading the Southern Risk Group for Asia Pacific, the Middle East and Africa at Moody's. And uh, she's been uh, one of the leading uh, persons in, in the uh, credit rating agency world uh, to work on, on climate related risks. And uh, I'm looking forward, uh, Marie, to, to your take on these issues. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rish. And I'll join Nisha and really thank you for thanking you to put this paper together, uh, which um, is both an extremely useful reference paper, but also with the, uh, the, the new research there and addressing a question that we as rating agencies often get uh, about um, the, uh, the, the extra, the additional cost that the sovereigns that are most in need to invest uh, to adapt to and, and mitigate climate change are facing. So um, having this, this thorough analysis there uh, available to us is extremely useful. Um, I wanted to maybe recall briefly how uh, we at Moody's um, are looking at this. And, and it, is, it is a work in progress, but work that has been in progress for now uh, in, in earnest for, for three years or so. Um, and I will uh, soon come to really, uh, uh, I think, a, a very important milestone in that some of you may have seen, we put out a, a request for comments. So it's, it's a, our announcement to the market that we will publish uh, what we call ESG credit impact scores. And uh, the, the desire to publish the scores is again to uh, address uh, an analytical need that we perceive and it's certainly a, a demand that we get from investors from issues including sovereigns uh, to uh, ultimately systematize formalize and be more transparent about the credit impact of uh, ESNG and so here today we, we're focusing on on climate change as part of that uh, and certainly very relevant there. So we have integrated uh, climate change in, a, in our credit analysis, in our ratings uh, for a number of years. And you, you explained that very clearly in the, in the paper, how we do this. Um, in a nutshell, uh, what we find useful is really to first identify exposure. Um, and that's driven by, uh, by topography, by geography. Uh, driven also by uh, what we call sensitivity, which is really the, the, the fabric of the economy, the, uh, the composition maybe of the, the population, the society, the location of uh, the population to that can exacerbate or mitigate the impact of climate change in through natural disasters or through long-term trends. So we have that, that exposure and that sensitivity, and we do look at resilience. And as far as resilience is concerned, um, there's one, aspect of resilience that I think is, is specific to climate change is really what governments, what measures governments taking uh, to, uh, to adapt and to mitigate. And here um, I would uh, echo the, the point that Nisha has, uh, has just made. Uh, in our experience, most governments are at very, very early stage. And, and it is difficult for us as a rating agencies, as rating analysts to really assess the effectiveness of, uh, of that investment. Uh, I think we are uh, reassured um, by some sovereigns at least having, a, having an action plan and um, engaging maybe with multilateral development banks and other partners to invest there. But it, it seems so far uh, relatively early days uh, in relation to the, the size of the challenge. Uh, there's a broader aspect to resilience, which is uh, something that as rating agencies we, we, we're certainly familiar with, but that is, is relevant, which is the broad uh, it, financial and institutional resilience that sovereigns can bring to face any shock. Uh, and the shock might be a pandemic today, uh, it might be uh, climate change today and tomorrow, uh, but uh, ultimately um, having financial buffers and having uh, strong governance will probably place some, some sovereigns much better to face this. Now, uh, when we, we, we look at this, we, I mentioned the, the shocks and the trends, and I think that's important. And on one point I wanted to make, and maybe a call for further research, uh, which is that uh, I think we, we understand uh, increasingly well, I think, the impact of the shocks, the natural disasters, uh, partly because we can, we can we observe them. And we, we rate 145 sovereigns around the world. 
including small islands, including a um, number of sub-Saharan African countries, uh, countries in the, uh, in the Caribbean or the Pacific. Uh, and in a given year, unfortunately, uh, there will be a number of them hit by uh, a natural disaster, a big storm, a drought, um, and uh, other natural hazards. Uh, so we can observe that, and, and so far our observation is that it's a big impact. Um, sometimes economic lo losses that you know very well can amount to a uh, large proportion, sometimes multiples of the, the country's GDP. Um, but interestingly, in practice, uh, after an initial dip, so far at least, we've generally observed a quick rebound, uh, and a quick rebound that tends to be uh, partly at least finance when uh, in particular, when the shock, uh, the, the natural disaster hits a relatively poor country, uh, partly financed by international aid or international financial support. Um, and so uh, in most cases, we do not take a rating action. So we do, we do not downgrade this summit uh, because one, that exposure is already embedded in the rating. And because what we observe is uh, an, an adjustment, a relatively quick adjustment. But when a question comes in, and that's my call for further research, is can we um, get better, more robust estimates about the uh, implications of these shocks becoming increasingly frequent and increasingly severe? Um, it is one thing for a country to face a major storm once every, um, I don't know, if we talk about something really exceptional once every 10 years. It is potentially very different and potentially very different in a non-linear way uh, for that country to face the, these, these sort of storms every other year. Um, so what if what are the implications of uh, economies not having the time to rebuild? Uh, what are the implications then of investment ex ante if companies will now need to factor in that uh, within two or three years, within the, at the very early stage of the lifetime of their investment, that investment uh, runs a, a significant risk of being uh, being damaged. I haven't seen research on that, on, on really how do we uh, factor in really this, this non-linear, potentially um, very significant um, amplifying factors from the frequency and, and increased frequency and severity of natural disasters. And, and that to me is the key question. And that to me is the key, what uh, I said that we, we, to the best of our ability, integrate climate change in our ratings, I think this is where we could be wrong, uh, where we could be underestimating the impact uh, because we use the, the, the climate science that is available to us, uh, but I would think our capacity to um, predict this sort of um, nonlinear effects is, uh, might, be, might be so far constrained. So um, that is one, and maybe again, and uh, very enough of that uh, Nisha's remarks were, were very, very well put, in terms of communication about why does it make sense to invest now rather than later, um, maybe there's just some of that, that look, the, the costs are only going to rise, um, but rise in, in a more than proportional fashion. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not really a straight line through the frequency of these natural disasters, but that increased frequency has really um, very big, more than proportional impacts. Um, so, um, that's, that's currently where we are, uh, and maybe just uh, as a last point, of course, is that uh, climate change is, is one aspect. We also uh, relatedly uh, increasingly focusing on, on water, which is, might be related to climate change, but there, there are really water risks there um, that go beyond, um, beyond climate change. And then this is part of an ESG framework. So uh, in all this analysis, there might be the environment as the immediate source of shock, um, but with um, quite significant social implications that we do uh, factor in. And I mentioned that through the resilient aspect, of course, the importance of, uh, of governance and all that. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much, Marie. And so uh, in the report in our chapter on Southeast Asia, we actually also look at water risk. And, and uh, as you say, this is indeed a major, major issue along with heat stress uh, in, in, in other regions. Um, that you highlight, you had how come 
trying to to prepare to to mitigate these risks, but that it is not so easy. Uh, and and I think that that will be a key point going forward. You know, we we want countries to to invest in resilience, do the right things. But the second part of that story is, of course, we need to make sure that this is also then being recognized um, and, and uh, also so by rating agencies and also by financial markets uh, so that this also translates into a lowering of the cost of capital, which, as we explained, is, is one, one of the big problems. Um, so thanks a lot, Marie. Um, I will uh, I'd like now to... to Leslie Nlovu, uh, Leslie is CEO of the FD, which is a company that provides electric insurance coverage for African countries against extreme weather events and natural disasters. So uh, Leslie uh, is, is really an expert on, on how to deal with these risks down on the ground. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward, Leslie, to your insights. So, uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Uli. So then uh, I will focus really my remarks on the impact on, on agriculture, because agriculture is extremely important to African countries as it contributes about one third of the GDP and provides about two thirds of the employment uh, opportunities. And when you think about uh, natural disasters, they have the greatest and most disproportionate impact on uh, small uh, to medium scale farmers. And in Africa, currently uh, 80 to 90% of the agricultural output comes from these uh, smallholder uh, farmers. So from an insurance uh, standpoint, uh, agriculture is important for obviously uh, food security on the one hand, but then there is a very strong transmission mechanism between what is happening in the agricultural sector and what is happening in the broader economy, as I alluded to, given the very large percentage of agriculture in the economy. So what we observe is that after a drought in a country, we see uh, much lower tax uh, revenues, uh, an increasing default rate in the financial sector to the extent to which the uh, banks have lent uh, to farmers uh, and players in the agricultural sector. Furthermore, we also see some other effects such as internal migration, you know, as people try to move within the country to areas that are less uh, severely impacted uh, by, a, by a drought. And in the way that we, we work, uh, I will agree with uh, what was expressed earlier that you know, a comprehensive risk assessment is really the starting uh, point. And we encourage countries to have the risk layering approach where for the very high frequency and low severity uh, droughts uh, in particular, the recurrent uh, droughts as it were, the country mitigates this through uh, setting aside money in the annual budget just to deal with these sort of cases as a matter of routine. As the severity of drought increases and the uh, frequency decreases, you have this mid uh, level where this is best dealt with through some contingency fund. And in the years where you don't have a drought, then there is a, replenish a re natural replenishing of the funds that are sitting in the contingency fund. And then, at the sort of top layer of the risk spectrum for the uh, droughts that are extremely uh, severe, but very less uh, frequent, you, you, we will then integrate insurance because again, insurance uh, doesn't have the magic properties of being able to solve every single problem that exists, but insurance works best for the uh, low frequency and high severity uh, droughts. And this is uh, the space that for us as insurers uh, we, we play in. And the role of insurance is critically important in building resilience and ensuring that the country is able to bounce back after uh, a natural disaster. We also see the 
a tangential benefit of insurance arising from increasing the sophistication of countries and enabling them to better understand risk. Because for you to be in a position where you can figure out which of the risk you want to retain versus which of the risk you want to place in the international in the international insurance markets, you need to develop a very sophisticated and nuanced understanding uh, of, of risk. In the specific case of the African risk capacity, we uh, use uh, a risk pooling uh, approach to put the countries in Africa into a sovereign uh, a risk pool, which then allows them to benefit from uh, the solidarity mechanism uh, of, 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 of insurance. Then coming back maybe to address some of the findings uh, uh, in your study and what my core panelists have alluded to. Uh, I like the output of the study because it clearly shows the cost of climate change. In the past, one of the barriers to addressing the challenges of climate change has been that uh, we have been unable to uh, accurately quantify what the cost of climate change is. And in your study, you can see that the high risk countries uh, pay the 275 basis points, while the low uh, risk countries are paying only 133 uh, basis points. So if you multiply the differential by the outstanding uh, amount of debt, this starts to express in dollar terms what the cost of climate change is to a particular country. And it will be interesting then as an academic study uh, to see what the cost of mitigation and adaptation is versus the, co the, the lower cost of borrowing that would arise as a result uh, of that. Also referencing the study that you've uh, done, I completely agree with the point number four uh, on the specific role uh, of insurance. And then maybe coming back to what uh, Marie raised uh, I'm happy to see that uh, Moody's is taking uh, an, an interest uh, in this and systematically integrating it into their risk assessment. I think it's through actions like this that countries will be better able to appreciate the risk that they, uh, that they face. And finally, maybe just to close on uh, another point that Marie raised, regarding the increasing frequency and, sev and severity uh, of uh, natural uh, disasters. In the insurance industry, we're obviously paying very close attention to all of this because ultimately it will result in much higher insurance costs uh, to the countries unless the increase in frequency and severity can be offset by adaptation and mitigation. Uh, I, I will stop here and I'm happy to go into more detail uh, when we have the interaction with the panel panelists. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Leslie. I think that was a, a very good illustration of, of uh, some of the very concrete challenges faced uh, in the agricultural sector, but also beyond, and the role that insurance can play. And uh, I'm, I'm now very pleased uh, to call on uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel Clark is the director of the Center for Disaster Protection, also in London. And uh, he, he's been uh, doing tremendous work uh, with governments and international organizations uh, on, on uh, preparing better for disasters uh, and, and, and reducing the, the uh, risks and uh, um, impacts. And um, uh, he's also actually published a very good that I can recommend uh, on, on dull disasters how planning ahead will make a difference. So I think that actually tunes very nicely uh, into uh, uh, kind of what we are trying to, to say in our report. Uh, and uh, Daniel, over to you. Great, thank you much for the introduction and, and the plug for the book. I should say the book is freely available online, so as, as well as being available from all good bookstores. Um, so most of my work and the Centre for Disaster Protection is on disasters and crises that might happen in the next year or tomorrow. Um, and I am going to bring in, I'd like to talk about two things from my experience and our experience working on that agenda for this discussion, primarily about macro fiscal risk management. Um, 
and I, and I come at this as a, you know, unashamedly as more on the sort of microeconomist side. Um, so, so the first question I have is, is it relates to what do we do about risks that don't sit on anybody's balance sheet? Um, so there are lots of risks out there that <laughs> governments hide behind their backs where people will willfully deceive themselves and each other, where nobody prepares and everybody hopes that somebody else will pay. Um, people hope that local government will pay, local government hopes that um, central government will pay, uh, central the government departments hope the finance ministry will pay, finance ministry hopes that the international community will pay. And because everybody is too busy looking up when it comes to risks, nobody is proactively managing those risks. And climate risk management is one of those things that can't be done centrally by a central government. It's not a sort of uh, one of those sort of classic macro fiscal risks that can, you know, where essentially you need a really well functioning finance ministry and government. It's something that's the job of everybody in society. So which balance sheets do these risks sit on? So you might think of agriculture in India. So whose risks do agricultural risks here for farmers in India sit on? Do they sit on the balance sheet of um, uh, rural banks? Uh, what, 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 what happens So if government is going to provide relief after, after, um, after large um, shocks to agricultural production? Um, or if they are going to provide loan write-offs, um, does that sit on any balance sheet anywhere and is that properly managed or not? If you look at infrastructure um, and public assets, um, say in Philippines, um, for, for, for public assets that are, say, owned and maintained and managed by provinces, who, who is the responsibility to actually pay to reconstruct if they get hit by a cyclone? Is it the province? or actually might the national government come in with some funding? In which case, who really is the risk owner? Who has the incentives to manage that risk? And are they managing those risks? Um, you talked about international organizations um, and the international system. Um, you know, where do risks sit there? What risks really are, what re risks really are the international organizations taking on? Do we know what those are and, and why? And I think this, this is important because um, I think a lot of the big risks in, in, in life and a lot of the disasters we see fall between gaps. So, you, you know, you, a lot of your recommendations um, are premised on the idea that risks do sit somewhere. So your climate risk board, um, you know, would presumably capture risks that government owns up to. Um, uh, it may be just explicit contingent liabilities, not those liabilities that everyone else would like to push on government, but the government has not formally acknowledged. Um, disclosure is useful if the public sector or the private sector admits that they have these risks on their balance sheet. Um, and it may be that neither do. Um, you know, you know, you're only going to find out whose balance sheet the risks are on after the shock when there's a sort of negotiation through tabloids. Um, and then insurance markets, obviously insurance markets take on risks they're paid to. But if people if people think that they can get government to pay when they're when they lose their crop, why would they buy insurance? So that, so the first point, so I, I would like to see. Well, I'd be interested to hear the more macro view of this, because it seems to me that when it comes to things like banking crises, there, um, there's a lot of discussion in the macro fiscal context around risk ownership and clarifying that. But when it comes to natural hazards, which are where it's a bit easier, I mean, it's, um, you know, this isn't, this isn't defence, this isn't banking crises. These are risks that are generally modelable where you just need to stop agglomerating the risks at a country level and have them properly managed. And this, this point around making it clear who owns what risks should be relatively, um, you know, everyone should agree with the principle, even if everyone wants somebody else to own it. And, and the, the final point I wanted to make was, you mentioned a point about risk contingent loans. I would just say, be careful what you, risk, what, what you wish for. Um, so when I, um, you know, if I take out a loan to buy a house, my, uh, my bank doesn't tell me to install a smoke alarm or install locks on my front door. My insurer tells me that. And my bank tells me I need insurance if I want a loan. And I think when it comes to the international system, we have a lot of development banks that have been set up along the lines of a, a central bank or along the lines of a, um, you know, a typical um, national de development bank who, who have development in their blood. They're trying to promote development, but they act as banks. Um, until recently, we haven't had the same with insurers. We haven't had insurance companies at the at the international level who've who've helped countries actually, um, you know, 
invest in smoke alarms and try to make sure they have smoke alarms as well. Um, I've, I've just come after Leslie, who leads one of the, well, one of the only development insurers in the world, if not the only development insurer in the world in sub-Saharan Africa, in Africa, sorry. Um, I think we need to be thinking more creatively around the kind of international institutions we want. And I think we need to think beyond risk contingent loans. I think we should be thinking about a different kind of institution along the lines of development insurance, um, where um, loans should be attached to insurance products, which not only um, help to protect against shocks, but also provide good incentives. Um, and and um, closing, just to remind you, we're obviously in the middle of the largest global crisis since the Second World War. Um, whose balance sheet did that sit on? Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I don't, I don't want to go into the discussion now, but, but just, uh, I think your point about raising, you know, kind of risk ownership, you know, whose uh, balance sheet is the risk on, uh, is a really important question. And um, so I come from, from a macro uh, perspective. And uh, so I've been working a lot with central banks and, and also Ministry of Finance. And um, from there, you often have a rather macro perspective. And, and uh, you know, central banks traditionally would not be looking at these kind of risks, you know, because ultimately these would be kind of micro risks. But what we are arguing in our report is that uh, through these different channels that we've discussed, uh, climate related physical and transition risks can ultimately uh, become macro financial risks. And macro financial risks have to be dealt with by uh, central banks, supervisors, finance ministries, which traditionally haven't really looked much into these issues. And this is changing now. I mean, we, we've over the last couple of years, we've, we've really made big advances uh, among central bank in looking at climate related risks and, and, and uh, this is an attempt to broaden the discussion um, and, and uh, also uh, shed light on, on other uh, macro financial risks uh, uh, um, uh, that may arise. And uh, so at the end of the day, um, a lot of the micro risks, if things go wrong, uh, can end up at the doorstep of the central government. That doesn't mean that the central government will, will be necessarily in a position to really deal with them, uh, but I think it is of utmost importance that there is a, a, a proper analysis of what the potential risks are. And indeed, then uh, there needs to be a discussion how to, to, to address them. And I fully endorse your point, you know, that, that we need um, risk management, risk mitigation at all levels, at the community level, uh, at the regional level, but certainly also at the, at the central uh, level of the central government. Uh, but le le let's go back to that uh, discussion um, uh, uh, when, when we have the open discussion. Um, but now I would like to, to introduce, last but not least, uh, uh, Natalie Ambrosio uh, Prudhomme uh, from um, 4 to 7. And uh, Natalie has actually been uh, one of the co-authors of our, our study. And um, so Natalie is, is the Director of Communications for 427, uh, uh, which is one of the leading uh, providers of data on uh, physical climate and environmental risks. And, and um, uh, she's uh, done a lot of work on resilience building and also uh, on uh, data, including the Notre Dame uh, Global Adaptation Index, which, which we also partly use in our analysis. Uh, Natalie, over to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Uli, for the introduction. Thank you for having me. And also thank you for the other panelists for your remarks. You brought up great points. And I'm going to touch a little bit on that interplay between the local risk exposure and the macroeconomic impacts. Um, firstly, as Uli mentioned, I'm Director of Communications at 427, and we are an affiliate of Moody's. Uh, I will start with a quick disclaimer that unlike Marie, I do not speak on behalf of the credit rating agency, Moody's Investor Service, and nothing I say should be construed as rating information. At 427, we focus on modeling exposure to physical climate risk, 
leveraging global climate models and other environmental data sets. This is how we contributed to this report. And firstly, I'll just say how grateful I am to have been able to contribute to this report. And I'll focus my remarks on how I think the report demonstrates progress that has been made, while of course also showing that there's still much to be done in terms of understanding climate risk exposure, understanding how these risks translate into macroeconomic impacts, and also understanding what should be done about this information. So first, the key progress that has been made in terms of understanding the vectors through which, through which climate risks affect sovereign risk, and in terms of modeling this granular forward-looking climate risk exposure. On top of providing the new empirical evidence that climate risk exposure increases the cost of capital that John presented, the report underscored this robust understanding that has been developed around the transmission mechanisms from climate change to credit risk, as Uli discussed. Alongside this understanding of how climate change affects sovereign risk, comes the need for understanding physical climate risk exposure at a very granular level in order to understand the economic impacts and to inform adaptation efforts. So for example, one of the case studies that we contributed examined infrastructure in the Philippines, finding that 80% of assessed assets had high risk to heat stress, 75% had high risk to hurricanes, and around half were highly exposed to floods. This included many ports and airports. So disruption at these assets does increase costs locally, but it also leads to rippling impacts domestically and also internationally, which could affect global supply chains and trade dependencies if this becomes a recurring problem. Similarly, we looked at physical risk exposure in corporate manufacturing sites owned or operated by large publicly traded companies. In Vietnam, all of the assessed sites are exposed to heat stress, a third to floods and half to cyclones. This can create shocks taking facilities offline, but it can also lead to long-term stresses. For example, increasing energy costs due to heat stress and, and declining labor productivity from heat stress can decrease productivity both at the firm level and lead to reduced growth also at the macroeconomic level. Understanding where this exposure is coming from is essential to informing adaptation and preparedness measures that address both these local risk exposures and also the downstream impacts. The report underscored the need for understanding two elements together when striving to understand physical climate risk exposure and what this means. Firstly, there's a need to understand what's happening at the local level, rather that be at a city, a corporate facility, an agricultural site. And secondly, a need to understand the projected climate conditions at this precise location. So there has been significant progress on this second piece. The understanding of how to model different dimensions of risk exposure at granular levels does continue to improve. And the next generation of climate models, CMIP-6, is starting to roll out. And this will help to continue to refine these forward-looking climate data analytics. That other element of understanding the location of act and activity of specific assets is essential because uh, assets location, its activity is what's going to determine uh, how its exposure to climate risks uh, really affects its operations and its costs. But this continues to present significant challenges for financial institutions, banks, and governments. They continue to struggle to gather information on the precise location of the physical assets that are underlying their loan and investment portfolios. On top of this information on where an asset or activity is located is the layer of understanding preparedness or risk mitigation at the local level, which is of course an essential element to understand alongside this information on physical risk exposure. Now, to Marie's point, the other large opportunity for further research is this translation from the detailed understanding of climate risk exposure into a measure of the size of expected financial impacts from that exposure, both at the macroeconomic level and from an issuer level perspective. 
this is a key research area for many organizations and is something 427 is working on together with Moody's Analytics. Overall, the report highlights that there's a need for a high level macroeconomic view of everything that can be affected by climate change in a country, but also this need for a detailed view on where the specific exposure is centered and the vectors that drive these impacts to inform targeted interventions and adaptation measures. Something 427 is working on now is new sovereign climate risk data that captures how much of a country's GDP population and agriculture is exposed to specific climate hazards. And this can really help connect the dots between granular risk exposure and the ways that it, this exposure may manifest in macroeconomic risk. The last thing I want to highlight, uh, building from Nisha's point, is that this report clearly demonstrates the need and the importance of adaptation and resilience. And in addition to the essential risk mitigation benefits of adapting and building resilience, this is also important because it sends the signals to investors that countries are preparing and taking this seriously. This can help encourage investors to continue to invest in regions, even when they're highly exposed to climate change, because the country itself is also investing in its own future. I'll end there for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Natalie. And uh, now I would like to invite now I would like to invite all panelists to uh, switch on their video. And um, uh, so let's have a, have a discussion among ourselves. And I would first like to, to do a quick uh, tour in the same round, uh, in the same order of, of appearance. Um, if everyone could, could uh, you know, just make the, they really to, to add to the discussion now in response to uh, what others said, or you know, to clarify something, or um, Anisha, do you want to? Sure, I'll take first? a look. Yeah, um, thanks, and thank you to everyone. I think uh, this is going to be a pretty interesting discussion. Um, one of the things that I maybe wanted to pick up on is Marie's point um, about evaluating the effectiveness of the investments that we're making, right? And then this is early days, but I think this is touching upon something that's sort of brewing in multiple. Um, discussions, not just the public side, but also the private side, which is the need for metrics and the need for metrics on multiple fronts, not just in what to invest in and what the quality of investments are, but also how do we know when we are meeting certain standards and certain um, sort of progress points, right? How do we know that we are actually getting towards something that is going to be collectively and cohesive, cohesively getting us to a more resilient future? And I think that's something that maybe we can talk about. And I think that also, um, points to the nuances of what the micro impacts are versus what the macro impacts are. Um, and I think one of the other things that's coming up is this issue that within a country you might have microeconomic impacts that then relate to or result in social instability or political instability, but that might not be felt outside, um, but still has an implication on what the public um, public balance sheet looks like, right? So Daniel, to your point about implicit liabilities, we don't see that until after the fact. And so how do we manage that proactively and what are the um, instruments at hand that we can do? So maybe I'll stop there and hand it off to Marie actually. Thank you. Um, thank you and I'm happy to take some of the questions that come from the uh, audience as well. I think are, are related to all this. Um, I think, and. I referred to, to Nisha's points earlier, which uh, yeah, that that aspect of governments, the, 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 uh, the own actions by the government, uh, how can they um, how can they know intimately that they're investing in the right uh, technology and the right sort of projects to uh, clearly effectively uh, adapt and mitigate uh, adapt to and mitigate climate change? I think it's uh, is a major question. Um, I was also interested in, in picking up on some of the points that Melissa mentioned. Um, over, over recent years, uh, it seems there have been nascent signs of uh, various new financial products coming, and I'm, I'm thinking about insurance uh, in, uh, in that sense, uh, including insurance from, uh, for sovereigns. Um, and um, I'm not sure they've, they've really taken off uh, to a, a significant extent so far. It might be because of the, the difficulties ultimately to 
um, price this risks, assess this risk for insurers or investors in general. And, and so going back to the, the need for uh, more and more comparable metrics, I think is, is a big part of that. Uh, but I was I was interested in in perspectives there as to uh, what are the prospects there for um, insurance and other types of, of financial uh, innovation to play a role. Um, maybe I can take there's one question about how we uh, ultimately how we integrate uh, climate change and how we uh, in in our ratings. Um, I think what what we do so we we do rely on uh, on data and expertise from Core Twenty Seven and uh, others to give us an assess and an, a forward looking assessment of exposure um, and uh, especially in um, of uh, an assessment of really what might be uh, the uh, the countries in our case and now my team is is the sovereign based what might be the the countries exposed to. Uh, certain really high risk periods. I guess that's uh, what we, we're looking for there. Um, we don't have at this stage, uh, I don't think there is really, uh, there are established models to then translate that exposure into uh, economic, social, financial metrics uh, in, a, in a robust manner. There are increasingly, there are a number of macro studies and that do uh, estimate the impact of climate change on macroeconomic environment. Um, I think what, what they do is, is really look at uh, the, the long-term trends. So the rising temperatures, the impact that it would have on productivity, uh, these sort of aspects. And my and that's why really I, I mentioned these non-linear points because my, my read of this is that when you look at the estimated impacts, um, they might be surprisingly small. Uh, and uh, we, we're talking here, about uh, countries like uh, India or in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, where by 2050, 2100 even, uh, climate change is estimated to maybe lower GDP by 10%. When you, when you think about the margin of error around any projections of GDP at these, uh, these intervals, 10% is, it's, uh, it's within, uh, really well within that band. And I think really what, what is really difficult to, to get is beyond these long-term trends, beyond the impact of rising temperatures, uh, maybe sometimes rising sea levels might be incorporated in terms of forcing relocation of economic activity, is that aspect of the, the, the repeated shocks uh, and uh, how that, that affects the, uh, the macroeconomy. So in practice, what we, uh, in the absence of that established knowledge, uh, common knowledge, what we do is we observe. Um, we observe what is uh, what is happening, and um, we do observe big differences. I, I'll, I'll take an example of uh, Fiji was hit by um, a, a storm, big storm, Winston it was called in 2016. Um, so this is relatively recent, but at the same time we have the benefit of hindsight. And quite quickly, quite quickly after the storm, the, the government came up with a, an estimate of the cost, which is very credible, 20% of GDP of damage, um, damage to infrastructure, damage to uh, economic income loss, revenue loss, uh, and so on. So 20% of GDP is very big. During that time, GDP growth actually only dipped, uh, dipped, slowed uh, to about 2.5% that year in 2016. So slowed down by Fiji standards, but not. Uh, not something that is dramatic. And interestingly, government debt uh, did not increase. Uh, and that's because um, aid and, and financial support was forthcoming um, through uh, international aid um, in, in some part, uh, insurance as well, uh, so to, to buffer the shocks. Uh, this is not necessarily the typical uh, natural disaster, but it's really through the, the wealth of this experience that we observe, um, we've observed much more severe uh, natural disasters and uh, there have been some in the Caribbean, St. Martin, and uh, I think you, you all remember Puerto Rico, for instance, uh, that had a, a much more damaging impact. So what we do is, based on that exposure assessment, uh, combined with what would be a, a typical natural disaster, which would be a loss of economic activity of a few percentage points, an increase in, uh, in government debt, uh, that is commensurate to that. That's our our baseline, if you want, for the exposed countries. And uh, if it turns out that the shock is bigger or the capacity to respond to that shock is, is weaker than we, we had expected before, that is where we start to factor in some, some rating implications and that we, we didn't have, um, we haven't factored in examples. 
Thank, thanks, Marie, and also uh, for from from the chat. You on on what rating agencies? Have. Overview, and, uh, Leslie. Be aware that we have only ten minutes left, uh, so so we uh, need to uh, be careful on time. Uh, Leslie, over to you. Yeah, so uh, I I think I can be quick because most of the points have already been covered by uh, my co-panelists. I, I just wanted to touch on sort of this idea that was raised by Daniel on the ownership of risks. Uh, it's a critical point to uh, to cover because. Uh, the current COVID pandemic is a very good example of, 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 uh, of, of this, who ultimately bears uh, that risk because we've seen uh, the government chip in to some extent. We've seen the insurance uh, industry as well, even though on the business interruption side, uh, there haven't been much claims uh, uh, paid out because of this uh, need from an insurance standpoint to at least have material physical damage before you can be entitled to uh, a business interruption uh, claim. And then uh, maybe the other point that I wanted to talk about is uh, the fact, I think all these issues uh, are, are quite well known in terms of the cost of uh, climate change, uh, the impact of natural disasters, but we also need to examine the reason why governments uh, don't act. And of course it's multifaceted on the insurance side you know, one of the issues to address is around uh, premium affordability because uh, it's quite expensive to insure uh, against natural disasters and the payment of insurance competes against other national priorities like education, like defense, uh, like health and so forth. And the value of insurance is only seen uh, whenever a country has a very large uh, payout, you know, after a natural disaster and in the absence of a payout, then the money that is spent on insurance uh, is seen as being wasted. So I, I will stop here to give my fellow panelists an opportunity to chime in as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leslie. And I think uh, it's also clear that insurance has to be part of the solution, but, but as you say, it's not the silver bullet. And uh, indeed, a lot of risks can't be insured uh, because uh, the premium would be so high and 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 uh, unless you find someone who who's really willing to provide large subsidies but um this is not not always so easy um daniel thank you much i'm just gonna um carrying on the insurance theme actually um responding to something marie said so i was um so i had a conversation with a finance minister from a large asean country last year it feels like a very long time ago um because it was a uh, pre-COVID, but it was only last year. Um, and we were talking about the role of insurance in infrastructure. And his view was he wanted to have all of his public infrastructure, new, all his new public infrastructure insured. The reason why he wanted it insured was not because he needed the payouts if, if, a, if a cyclone hit. Um, what he wanted was he wanted the discipline. He, want, he didn't trust um, his... Um, his, his um, government officials to build the buildings right um, or you know through the procurement process to build them in a way where they would stand up to the wind blowing and he wanted the insurer there almost as a warranty on the work that um, his um, his civil servants were doing now obviously insurance um, insurance markets for disaster risks sometimes don't work very well um, you can sort of end up paying too much um, and it is possible to do some of this through budgetary mechanisms. So there are some countries that have, they specifically have a budgetary mechanism where a government department is able to take a contingent liability onto their balance sheet. And then there are some controls around scrutiny and reporting, but it, it, it can be difficult to get that right. So I just wanted to flag, I think, I think when we think about insurance, um, it's not just about making sure that countries have the right amount of money and in fact I would even say, I would say that's quite a small part of it I think it's around bringing somebody in who's actually on the hook for the risk and you can do it with the private sector or you can do it in the public sector ultimately somebody pays um, do you have somebody who has those risk controls in place who um, who, who sort of feels like um, they are owning the risk who are who actually is accountable to somebody um, and who has the right job description 
um, you know, particularly in the public sector, they have the right job description to do what society needs them to do. I, I agree, and I want to add that uh, one really important part is, of course, to 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 mitigate risk. Uh, so, uh, kind of, kind of what, what are the out, uh, underlying vulnerabilities? And and this is why in the report we really highlight the starting point has to be a very comprehensive vulnerability assessment at all levels. And I again, I, I fully take your point about the you know different ownership of risk. It's in the private sector, it's in the public sector, it's at the you know, local level, the regional level, the national level. If everything goes wrong, ultimately the buck stops with kind of the central government, which may or may not be able to do something, depending on how well prepared they are and so on. Also what the international support mechanism is. But, but I think we are still not having the complete picture, and I'm not saying that we're providing that in the report, but what we to do is really these are the different chances of risk and we need to dig deeper the the uh, it's actually you know the data situation is still fairly poor uh, to properly analyze many of these risks and of course and also so even even with kind of present day data uh, and then of course uh, given that we are dealing with climate change and it's very much about you know forward looking risk it's becoming even more difficult but uh, so if, if we don't uh, have this comprehensive uh, assessment, then everything afterwards is also very difficult. And, and, um, and uh, sorry if I, if I just um, I respond to one more point uh, that, that uh, um, Daniel actually raised about, you know, uh, risk contingent loans and so on. I don't think we were actually calling for, you know, any specific uh, tool to be the silver, you know, there is no silver bullet. It, it really has to be a very comprehensive effort. Uh, we need all actors to really realize the risks and, and see what they can do about it. And, and uh, a lot of different things can help. Insurance can be one part, but you know, if we're just hoping for insurance to do the trick, um, we'll do. Uh, we're, we're doomed. Or kind of many of the countries will be doomed. But sorry, um, uh, 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 Natalie, let me uh, hand over to you. Yeah, thank you. Building on what you were just saying, I think a key thing to remember with climate risk vulnerability is that it's so context dependent, um, both the risk, but also what adaptation is necessary. And bringing back that conversation around metrics and improved data, there's a need for metrics around quantifying resilience, uh, what resilience investments have taken place and the benefits of those resilience, which is inherently challenging because it's at its foundation, resilience an effective adaptation or preparedness, it means that no loss will happen. It's the avoiding of an impact, um, which is inherently hard to quantify it consistently. Um, but that's something that really is important for continuing to incentivize and show the importance of uh, systematic resilience. And then just lastly, on the conversation around these macroeconomic impacts, just want to highlight research that we're working on is recalibrating uh, macroeconomic models by looking at historical events, extreme weather events, and how they have affected uh, different macro macroeconomic variables, doing that systematically in order to then recalibrate forward-looking macroeconomic models with this adjusted view of how this more systematic recurrence of climate hazards is likely to affect them. So hopefully this ongoing research uh, will help to shine light on some of these transmission channels in a more systematic forward looking way. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And so I was actually hoping to do a closing round, but we have one minute left. So uh, there won't be a closing round, but just a, a, a mini wrap up from me. Um, I, I think, I think this was a fascinating discussion and, and it, it shows that there are still so many issues we, we, we haven't really settled yet. I hope that this report will contribute to the discussion. Um, uh, we're not, not providing the answers to, to all the, the issues uh, that have been raised, but, but um, uh, I think it's very clear that there is much need for further research and, and, and collaborative research. And I think 
you know, having having uh, the different stakeholders we, we've had in this discussion, you know, that, that, that shows, you know, we, we need all of us to really engage with this and, and try to bring this forward. Um, because the stakes are really high and uh, for, for many countries, this is really a matter of life, a matter of life and death. And uh, we need governments to really scale up uh, their ambition and indeed all actors, also the private sector to, to scale up ambition in, in uh, adapting to climate change, building resilience. And um, of course, there also uh, needs to be appropriate uh, financial means to do that. Um, and, and so let me just mention that on, on Monday, we had a report uh, launch of, um, we were proposing debt relief for uh, uh, highly indebted uh, countries uh, that will put them in a position to invest in a green and inclusive recovery. Um, and this investment in adaptation resilience really has to be part of that um, crisis response. Uh, we need to make sure that all countries really have the means to, to do that. Um, so I would like to thank very, very much uh, all the panelists for, for excellent contributions and uh, I'm looking forward to continue working with you on, on this issue and everyone please reach out if, if you want to discuss any aspects and, and the team uh, and I will be very happy to, to engage with you. Thank you so much. Uh, this video, oh, this has been recorded, this will be put online uh, and then and, uh, and share with everyone who, who may be interested. Thank you so much and uh, enjoy uh, a lot of excellent uh, uh, further events uh, during the rest of London Climate Action Week. Thank you and bye bye.